Good morning all. Good morning. Good morning to our listeners and on our tapes and video calls. So, we hope you're all well. Uh, we'll be thinking about you. This morning's talk is, uh, will be called On the Road to Damascus. It is about Paul's life and what he did and how he came to be a great person in the laying the foundation of the Christian beliefs amongst the Gentiles. But Paul, what do we really know about him? And who was he? The scriptures tell us he was called Saul. And he was a Roman citizen from Tarsus, that's in Turkey. And he was born 4 BC. He was a strict Pharisee, um, of this, probably a member of the Sanhedrin, but he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as we would say, he really was there strict. He was devout and he was strict to the letter of the law. And he also died between 62 and 64 AD. There is a lot of controversy about Paul and his, how his, his missionary statements. But it's like everywhere and everybody. There's always um, people to think something different. But the Lord did use him. And he, as I say, he did lay the foundation of Christianity among the Gentiles. But he was strict with himself. And he expected others to obey the way standards set out by God to the nation of Israel. And he really did go out of his way to, on the, after the Jewish converts with as much dedication even to chasing them across the provinces to wipe them all out. Such was his beliefs in God and obedience to the letter of the law. This Jesus and his followers were actually diluting this, thought, this doctrine. And they had added and added and added to the law all these little bits and pieces that Jesus called burdens on the people because they were so scared of going into captivity again that they were never going to face that again if they could help it. But because and they were, they were actually looking for the Messiah to come. They were looking for it really more than Navi than we were today because they were under um, persecution possibly but they didn't have an easy life because they were under the Roman authority. So a Messiah coming to relieve them of all these burdens that they had on them would have been wonderful to them. But so he didn't really fancy the Jesus and his followers to be diluting down this system that was keeping them as they thought safe. But um, after seeing Jesus crucified, now when Jesus entered this Jerusalem riding on a donkey and everybody hailing him as the king, the Jew, king of the Jews, and this was the Messiah that they were promised, they were really overjoyed. So you could see even Paul standing back and watching these things unfold and sort of thinking, well, is it or is it not? We shall see. But then, a week later, where's Jesus? He's crucified, he's died, he's buried. It's over. The, the apostles, his followers, all died, disappeared, they went home. They thought they'd go back to fishing. So where was all this going? This Messiah was definitely not what Paul and them were listening, waiting on. So, how could you believe, after he's seen all that, he says, how could you believe in a conquering um, deliverer? This Jesus was not the conquering deliverer. Hence, it went all out to wipe them out. All these misguided followers of Jesus. Now we see people like that here, a men at work, even today. We think of Russia, we think of Ukraine, we think of all these things like, you know, that people, thousands of people displaced, thousands of people dead. For what? 
some man's thought, some man decided on something. And so I guess at that time, Paul was thinking the same thing. They were saying this here, this is not what it's supposed to be. Jesus was supposed to liberate them. But, so we started off out after all these followers to wipe them out, as many as you could. But, whilst on this road to Damascus, with his murder squad, he was halted. A great light shone on him, and the risen Jesus calls out to him, Paul, Paul, what are you doing to me? Why are you doing this? And you see, that's when Paul meets King Jesus. Because he was blinded by the glory of Jesus. And he asked him, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord tells him who he is. We don't know what all he said and what transpired in that. There is no records of it. But certainly, anyhow, he really got his attention and he removed his sight for three days. And then he sends him on to Ananias to be instructed in what he was to do. Do you know the funny thing it is? There he was out there, going with a crowd of people behind him, soldiers for to do all this wiping out. And here's these soldiers having to take him by the hands and lead him to Ananias to be taught. It was just a reversal of the rules, wasn't it? But you see, the Lord tells him all this here, and he humbles him. And he talk, but you see, he talk about a blinding experience. This really was a blinding experience for him. And it must have shocked him to the core. Now, to see in this great light must have been like not the sun. And hearing a voice accusing him of persecuting himself and his believers. So you see, Paul probably thought his time was up. <laughs> he was going to be, and that's just exactly what Jesus could have done. It just said, you're persecuting my people. Like me. I want them to spread this gospel all over the world. And he could have just wiped Paul out. But you see, he didn't. Because he sees beyond human beings. This Paul was a dedicated follower of what he believed in. And he was not going to have it messed up. So Jesus saw someone that he could work with. He saw a, a future in this man. That he would be as dedicated to doing what he wanted him to do once he got his attention. As what he was doing, what he didn't want him to do. But... Uh, Paul went on then to proclaim King Jesus' gospel to all who would listen to him and to the whole, when the whole truth was explained to him. You see, and there's the difference of getting what we need, is the whole truth. When you get the whole truth, you can believe in something, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as you understand the perfect truth of the matter. But so what Paul was, and you see, this was Paul's age of enlightenment. Paul was truly enlightened in what Jesus had told him, what he was taught then. And then rather than wiping out this sect who was portraying a whole new way of life, he joined it. He became a part of it, a crucial part of it. Because this sect was portraying loving, helping, enjoying each other's company and telling all and sundry about a new king. He was no, worry, no longer worried about bringing the occupying force down on them for proclaiming a new ruler. And he also learned what it was like to be persecuted because now the Sanhedrin and, and the and the governors and Roman and everything were after him. So he learned too then what it was like with what he had done. So he was really totally humble before God. But what do we learn from Paul's Damascus experience? This was a total change of heart. Complete. 
When Paul meets King Jesus, it was transforming. You know. You see, we talk about getting converted. So what does really being converted mean? When you really meet Jesus and you experience that, it is a total conversion of it. It transforms everything you think because it is a transformation from one thing to another. Now we all know about upcycling. When you become a Christian, you're upcycled. You're transformed into a spiritual aspect of your living life. Not a physical mentality, but a spiritual mentality. And that's what it means. We are being changed of use. When God calls you, you have a change of use. You're no longer your own person. You are now God's person. You are to do his work. You are to do what he wants you to do. Because when God calls you us, he means business. Thing is, how do we respond? Do we respond quickly over the years? Or do we take our time or do we jump in? And, do, and let it be immediate. Do you answer that call and say, yes, Lord, here I am? Everybody's different, like me. Um, we're all different in how God works with us, how we respond, where he brings us, how quickly. But we should respond very quickly whenever we get a call to think, not be like when the seeds fall on the different grounds, you know. We are to grow immediately and sprout up and start to do the work. But going back to Paul again, the convert, converts of that day were really afraid of him and there was no wonder. <laughs> it would take a bit of a while to sort of say, right, I'm happy with you, I think God is working with you, because they could hardly believe that he changed so quickly. But that's the whole difference. Paul changed immediately. Over three days he was out there a you know, changed man. Um, we're not supposed to take years for the change and to do things, to go out there and do and talk and show our light wherever we can. But you see, people don't believe you can change quickly. How many times have you heard Christ people um, malign Christians by saying, hmm. They haven't changed much. I didn't expect them to say that. I didn't expect them to do that. But although your heart might be changed, sometimes your actions take maybe a little bit longer, but it should be a complete change. And you go there, you get that. Because when we have that spiritual connection, we change. And God changes our hearts. He takes away that stony heart and puts in a soft, fleshy heart, a, fle a heart of love. Too many people, too many, all of us have that, still have a bit of heart of stone because we see things as wrong and we sort of think, oh, we should do that. That should be done. We should, we should do all sorts of things. But we don't look at them and say, God loves you. We should pray for them and say, Lord, would you change their heart? Change their attitudes? Change them? We should pray for them. We need to pray for all our politicians and all those. They have a very, very hard time at present. I wouldn't like to be in their shoes um, because there's so many people pulling them on every action. Like, I mean, you, you decide on a good idea and somebody else over here says, no, 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 you can't have that. That's not how it is. And that's not how God allows his people to work. So that's why we need to pray that God will work with the people that rule over us too. Because they do need to a spiritual connection to change their hearts. Because when that happens, we are enlightened and we are transformed. What do we do then? Well, according to Paul, he spent most of his time in prayers, and so did the apostles. They wanted to give all their time to pray and, and not serve and all the tables, they said. 
When you read Romans 1 and verse 1 to 8, it's all about Paul. But he does pray daily for all the believers, everywhere, throughout the world. Do we spend enough time praying for all the believers outside in the world? People we don't even know. Um, because we all need spiritual strength. And he prayed for a spiritual strength for those to use their spiritual gifts, any spiritual gift that they could have, for the benefits of others. And that's what we are supposed to be using our benefits for, to encourage and uplift and help people. He also prayed to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith and to strengthen each other's faith. As he says there in verse 6, I thank my God that through Christ God sends his love and forgiveness to us and through Christ we send our thanks to God. Now all this was groundbreaking news to a lot of people because before faith came you sacrificed. You offered offerings, burnt offerings, lots and lots and lots of them. <laughs> because there was sin offerings, there was love offerings, there was peace offerings. You can read it all back there in Deuteronomy and all. About all the offerings they had to do. And it must have been, it must have been a costly affair. Unless you could really stick to a very narrow path. But you see, if you were a strict follower of the law, it was a tightrope. Because look what, you, look what you had to do if you went off. And, but the thing about it is, for a Christian, it still is. It's still a tightrope. Because Matthew 7 and verses 13 to 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many are on it. You see, Jesus is that narrow gate. Or you could say, he is that door. You've got to enter through that gateway, that doorway, because he alone is that way to eternal life. And we have to bring every silly and evil thought captive to destroy it. It's not easy, but that's what we have to practice to do. The many worldwide are on a wide road. We see that. That road is, everybody's just heading down it. TV, TV is so corrupt now you couldn't find something on it that didn't want to watch. Um, it's, just, it's just messed up. Um, and Mary Whitehouse told them all this going back years and years and years ago. Um, that this would lead to the destruction of our children, the television things that they were putting on at that time, and they poo pooed her and chased her, and nobody believed her. But we see the results of that now. We see where our children are heading. They don't know what they are. They don't even know whether they're a boy or a girl, whether they want, you know. Satan has permeated everything that there is about us that. It'll take Jesus coming back even for to straighten it all out. Because I don't think even with the, us, you could reach as many as what you would need. But hopefully, when it, well, I need to say that because he said, Jesus is going to send his witnesses um, to, for three and a half years, I reckon, to speak in Jerusalem, which will probably, as I said before, go right out over TV and one thing or another. And what are they going to do with them? They're going to murder them. They don't want to hear. So it's not going to change anything. So we needn't berate ourselves if we can only just get a handful of people, you know, because, and I always say, it's, we start with our families and our friends and work with them. But they're leading down on this as leading to destruction. But there is this much smaller number that's on the narrow road leading to life. The story we tell about even the history of the world, and there are countless billions being spent worldwide 
on trying to find answers to what is out there in the darkest space. Because Jesus are going to put it into their heads that they need something more. They don't understand what the more is, but they keep on searching for it and looking and looking and looking. And it's right under their noses, but they can't see it. Maybe it's not always their fault. But does this, they all want to know where matter and everything comes from. So they may be a long time before they have their Damascus experience. They don't think they will. But we have through the ages had enlightenment moments. And we know all about the Ice Ages, Stone Ages, Bronze Ages and Iron Ages. When humans discovered new things. We grew, grew up learning all these new things all the time. People talk too of the end of the world. The Bible doesn't talk of the end of the world, it talks about the end of the ages. And there's only uh, yesterday, I think, it came to me about the hymn that they say, Rock of Ages, when it suddenly struck me that Jesus, the rock, is the rock of all the ages. <laughs> so it's funny how things hit you from time to time. But Jesus says he will be with us all to the end of the age. And again, people teach in parables, or to help us to understand things. Jesus says it was to keep them from understanding. And we only understand it from history, because we know what happened. Being filled with all this information, we only remember certain things in our lives, mainly the enlightening things. When all things, when things become clear and we understand them, we get a road to Damascus clear and understanding moment. And when we meet Jesus, we have our Damascus experience. We get a spiritual awakening that Jesus lives. But if we don't get that spiritual awakening, we only have the story. You see, and the end of the world is not true. It's just the beginning of another age. The beginning of a new age under that king. Born to earth, lived, died, rose again to conquer evil and set humans free. To give true liberation. It will be then the age of enlightenment for the whole world. Enlightenment for the whole world. Because when Jesus returns, everyone will have a road to Damascus experience. It'll be the age of freedom, of love, of kindness, of practicing the fruits of the Spirit. But in the meantime, we have to be careful with our lifestyle. We have to be careful about what forms our opinions. And look on it as in the Bible is the only standard of truth. We have to evaluate all of our opinions in light of its teaching. Paul's letters to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, to the Philippians and the Ephesians is the blueprint for Christian living. He explains faith, sin, grace, repentance and obedience and who and what you are in Christ. A new creation. We could continue on to, I could go back and read Colossians 3 and verse 1 to 17 but you can write that down because I feel if you read all of those um, books and letters that Paul wrote You'll never go very far from knowing what a true Christian should be and how they should live. But I would say I would make these your experience and make them your road to Damascus enlightenment. You can go back to lots of different um, 
verses. I can give you a, a list of them because it gives you Galatians 4, 1 and verses 11 to 24 is the authenticity of the gospel. And 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 3 to 11 it's Christ's life and teaching. And again, it's, it's sort of basically by Paul here, Acts 26 and verses 123, Paul speaks to Agrippa about his defense. I was going to read some of them, but I'm sort of thinking, um, Maybe I should read it for the sake of the tape. Once. So I will go back there and we'll just read Colossians 3. and Because um, we still have a bit of time. If I can find Colossians. Some of these things hide, don't they? Should have marked it. <laughs> I'm not fine, Colossians. Here we are. Uh, three. Colossians 3 and verses 1 to 17. Well, but read some of it. It says, If you were raised with Christ, we are to seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. We are to set our minds on the things above and not on the things on earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But now you must also put off all these anger, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, lies, Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian or uneducated, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also forgive them. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, in teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If we do all that there, we will have a wonderful life of experience and we will enlighten others even by our examples. So, thank you and God bless.